Take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. As we begin this morning, I want you to think with me a little bit. We are approaching rapidly what we commonly refer to as the Christmas season, when we remember the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm afraid that what has happened to so many is that we kind of take this for granted. Yeah, Jesus came. Jesus was born. It's old hat. When you get to be a little older, you've been doing this every year of your life, you remember, you hear about it, and yes, Jesus came. The fact of the matter is, I don't think we can even begin to, uh, to comprehend or understand how wonderful, how dramatic, how radical the coming of the Messiah was. Particularly... Put yourself in the place of the godly Jew at that time. You know, you, the early converts to Christianity were Jews. They formed the basis of the church in many, many regions that the apostles went forth and proclaimed the truth. Peter's first sermon, thousands were saved, most of them Jewish. Praise God. But put yourself in the place of those people. What was it like for them when Christ came? Think about it. For centuries, they had been taught and they were learning about the covenants that God made with the Old Testament saints. They learned about Adam. They learned about the account of the creation and how God is the one who made man in his image. And that during the fall, because of the fall of man, the, the promise of a redeemer was given right back in Genesis chapter 3. And they had been learning these things and understood these things all of their lives. Kids would go to school and learn about <laughs> the things and the truths from the scriptures. Right from the beginning of their lives they were being taught. They would learn about Abraham. They would learn about Mo, uh, Noah. And how God saved Noah and his family on the ark. We're going to have the privilege to visit that replica in two weeks. My wife and I. And I'll bring back a report. But we believe it. We know it. It was true. It was a display of the grace of God saving this family from destruction. These Jewish kids would learn about Noah and learn about these things. They would learn about Abraham. They would learn about Isaac and Jacob, Israel. They learned about all of these things. They grew up being taught about how Abraham would be made a great nation. They grew up being taught about Moses and the law, the various divisions of the law, the civil law, the ceremonial law. The moral law. All of these things they were taught in their Hebrew schools. And they would learn about God and his word. And they were taught about King David. And how wonderful and great King David was. And Solomon and the temple that he made. But as much as anything else. They would learn about a promised Messiah. The Messiah would one day come and deliver us and establish a new kingdom. The Messiah would come and they were taught this from the time that they were little children and many of them waited and many of them longed and many of them couldn't wait for the promised Messiah to come. They learned about what he did. They learned about the fact that he would come and do some of what we read right here in Isaiah 53. As you read here in this text, if you would look, please, from verse 4. This is what the Messiah would do. 
Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. This was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Turn now in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. They would learn about the Messiah. They would learn about the fact that he would be a child, as Isaiah said in the earlier chapter, that he would be this one who was to bear their sins. Romans 3, verse 21. But now. But now. All of these years they've been hearing about the Messiah would come. All of these years they had been learning about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And all of these years they had been hearing about the law of Moses. And how they were to keep the law of Moses. And all these years they were doing these things that they were expected to do in the synagogue and in the temple. All of these years. But now the Messiah has come. We have been looking through the first three chapters of the book of Romans. As the Apostle Paul, beginning in chapter 1, begins to teach all men that they are in danger of the wrath of God. Chapter 1 and verse 18 tells us, For the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness. This is what, they were, this is what the Apostle Paul has been teaching. Showing them the sin. Showing them the wrath of God. But now the promised Messiah has come. But now things have changed. He was that promised Lamb of God. Jesus was that promised Lamb of God. Jesus did everything that had been prophesied in the Old Testament about him. He perfectly fulfilled what was said would happen regarding him. He was that child. He was born to a virgin. He was born in Bethlehem. He was the spotless, sinless, God-man Jesus, the Son of God, who lived among men, dwelled among men, lived a spotless, sinless life. And he became that sacrifice, that ultimate sacrifice for sins. Now remember, the Jews knew about the ceremonial law. They would know. They would go to the temple. They had the lamb. They saw the blood shed. They understood that they would be shedding of blood for the remission of sins. But ultimately, there would be one sacrifice for the remission of our sins and that was the Messiah. Jesus did all of those things. He fulfilled that. What an amazing, what a dramatic, what a radical change had now occurred for the Jew. All of these years leading up to understanding the Old Testament. Knowing these promises, and now 
He's come. The Messiah has come. Things change. They go from the law to grace. Right here in this verse. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You understood that you had to keep the law. But now, you have faith in Christ Jesus. Now, you have grace. People, we've been looking again at what we're calling the foundation of our peace. Because if you look over the page at chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we began. And we had to go back and understand the context from which this comes. And here is what he talks about when he talks about justification in chapter 3. As I said a few moments ago, and he even sums it up in verse 23, for all who sin and fall short of the glory of God, he's been talking about the fact that everyone's a sinner. Jew, Gentile, male, female, young, old, we're all sinners. That's what he's been talking about since chapter 1 and verse 18. And he sums it up again here in verse 23. But then he says in verse 24, this dramatic change, this dramatic look now at grace rather than at law. And he says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now, we touched on this verse last Lord's Day. I understand that. After having seen all of these other areas, we now are looking at the grace of God, the glorious grace of God. Having seen the lost state of man, now the glorious grace of God. And we touched on this verse last Lord's Day. But this is an amazing verse. This is a key verse. This is a pivotal verse in all of the Bible. There are not many verses like this that so succinctly sum up what happens and what has happened with God and with grace and with you and me. So I want to take a little time today and begin to unpack this verse and open it up a little bit. Yes, it is evangelical, but that's a good thing. We need to know what we believe and why. So let's take a, look, a closer look at this verse, and I want to open it up in three sections. The, the verse naturally breaks down into every pastor has to have a three-part sermon. And that's the law. So this naturally breaks down into three parts. Now the first part begins with his saying, being justified. And I want to call that the transaction. The transaction. Something takes place here. We are justified. Justified. And we mentioned last Lord's Day that this word justified, dikaiuo in the Greek, means to render as righteous. It might even be better to say declared to be righteous. Now we have seen, and that's what we're looking at again, all the way back from Romans 1, 18, the wrath of God is revealed against from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. The wrath of God is against unrighteousness. And we're all unrighteous. And so how does that change from being unrighteous to being righteous? And here it is. We are justified, declared to be righteous. That's salvation, people. 
That's the difference between heaven and hell. We have been declared to be righteous. The phrase, the term is a forensic term. It is a legal term. It suggests a legal transaction. God is legally declaring you righteous. Declaring you to be righteous. It's a done deal. It's a transaction. Pronouncing you to be righteous before Him. And so again I say to you, all of your sins, all of that unrighteousness, all of that wrath of God and judgment that he talks about in the first three chapters, here to the one who is saved, is wiped away by God himself, declare, pronounced righteous. You could say pronounced saved. This is what is being said by the Apostle Paul. All of those 20 weeks that we looked at, the wrath and judgment of God, now declared righteous. Declared to be righteous. Now I want you to understand and please know that it does not say that you are made righteous. And I didn't want to give that impression from last week. It does not mean that all of a sudden we stop sinning and we are totally righteous. That is not what it says. It's not telling you or me that when you're saved, all of a sudden the next day you're going to be sinless. This is a declaration that in the eyes of God, regardless, in spite of your sin, you're justified. You're made to be righteous. It is not that you are <laughs> sinless anymore, but rather that in the eyes of God, you are righteous. You are pronounced righteous. Wouldn't it be nice if when we were saved, we were made to be completely sinless? But that is not the case. As a matter of fact, there are so many tender-hearted Christians, brothers and sisters, who constantly feel that they are just not good enough. They've been saved, they know they're saved, but oh, I just keep sinning. I just keep sinning and I'm, I'm, I'm just not getting the victory over sin. I'm, I'm fighting every day and I'm, I'm sometimes losing and I, I, I'm just no good. I'm not worth it. There are many like that, many people who feel that they're just not good enough. Well, you know what? You're not. That's the whole point. You are not good enough. You are still a sinner. None of us is good enough. None of us is sinless. Look at 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. Let's make sure that we understand this. First John chapter 1. Here, this is the apostle who loved the Lord. This is the apostle who was close to Jesus. This is John, the beloved John. And here's what he says in verse 6. If we say, well, let's pick it up in, in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. All right. First of all, he's speaking about being cleansed from all sin. That's the way it is for Christians. If we say that we have no sin, 
We are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We are all sinners. Back to Romans 3. We're all sinners. He even says it again in verse 23. All have sinned. This is the point. You are not good enough. You can never be good enough. We are always and only sinners. Saved by grace. But sinners nonetheless. And so, though you have horrible sin in your life, though you may even have continued sin in your life that you battle against day by day, you are still, in the eyes of God, if you're saved, declared to be righteous. None of us can be free from sin, but thank God, in the eyes of God, he looks upon you and he sees in you the righteousness of his son. As righteous as Jesus is, he sees that righteousness applied to you. You are therefore declared to be righteous by God. In spite of your sin. In spite of your wickedness. Some Christians never seem to understand that. I've known people in some churches who really think that they're better than people in other churches. Maybe they're theologically better. Maybe they know more theology. And therefore, they know what it means to try to be holy. We all strive to be if we're saved. But we are all sinners. Sinners. Now again, here, look at the text. It says, being justified as a gift. The best Christian is still a sinner, but he is righteous before God. And now the language is telling us that this is something that is in what is called the passive tense. The text says, being justified. This is not what we do. It's passive. It's done to or for us. Being justified. It's not that we become or we make ourselves justified. We're being justified. Being declared uh, justified, being declared righteous. So the language is telling us that it is not our doing. In other words, it has been done to us. Not that we've done it. Who did it? Being justified as a gift by His grace. He did it. And who's that speaking of? God the Father. God the Father. People, it is done to us by God. How many times have I been saying in the last couple of weeks, you cannot save yourself. You cannot declare yourself to be righteous. You can do it, but that doesn't mean anything. But you cannot make yourself righteous. All the works that people think that they do to make them good. All of the good deeds that they think will save them. All of these nonsensical things that people think that, uh, well, my good outweighs my bad. So when I get to God, he'll see my good and that will outweigh my bad and he'll let me into heaven. All of this stuff is nonsense. It is unbiblical. Your good does not outweigh your bad. You are a sinner. You cannot save yourself. You cannot make yourself justified. It has to be done for you. Being justified. 
being declared righteous by him, by God. Salvation is by God. He is the one who pronounces us righteous. But now also it's passive, it's done to us. But notice this, being justified is now in the present tense. It's something that has happened, but now it's in the present tense. We are justified. It's not we're going to be justified. It's not he's going to justify us. We are justified. Do you realize that the Christian does not have to wait to go to heaven to be told that he's saved? The Christian knows that he's saved now. He knows that he has been been, not going to be, not going to wait till I get to heaven to find out, well, did I make it? Uh, am I in? Or am I good enough? Or did, did my life of uh, good deeds get me in? Or did my faith in Christ get me in? You're already in. That's what he's saying. Being justified now. Now it's present. It's not that it happens in the future. It's done now. Today, the Christian knows that he is saved. He does not have to wait to get to glory to figure it out. He knows in his heart. He knows in his life. The Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are sons and daughters of God. And we cry, Abba, Father. We know that we are saved. We know that we have been justified by God. We enjoy our salvation even now. Can you imagine that? You're as much saved now as you will be when you get to heaven. You know, we think that that's going to be it. That, that's when we're going to have it. You already have it. You've been justified. By the finished work of Christ. I'm skipping over a part. But they will. That's what he's saying. We're justified now. All of these people. And these world religions. That tell people you cannot know. In this lifetime. If you've been saved. Are wrong. That is not what the Bible teaches. If you're genuinely saved. Today. You have been declared to be righteous by God today. You're saved. You're saved. You don't have to wait to find out. You know it. And any single one of you here today who is a Christian knows exactly what I'm talking about. I know I'm saved. And no one or nothing can change my mind or take that away from me. I know without a shadow of a doubt that I've been saved by the grace of God. I know that I have been declared righteous because His Spirit testifies to my spirit that I've been saved and cry, Abba, Father. This is the testimony of a Christian. This is what a Christian can know today. I move on to the second part. That's the transaction. Declared to be righteous. And now we move to the second part here. The cause of that transaction. How is it that we are declared to be righteous? Being justified as a gift. As a gift by His grace. It's because of His grace. And grace, the grace of God is a gift. Over and over, I know I'm repeating myself. But I keep hearing from the best preachers of old. That if you're not repeating yourself, you're not helping your congregation. So I'll, I'll listen to what they say and repeat myself. You can't save yourself. It is a gift. A gift from God. A gift from God out of His 
grace out of His graciousness. Justification comes to pass. We are declared to be righteous. How does this happen? How does it come to pass? How are we declared to be righteous? It is a gift. A gift from God. Now, some translations translate this word freely. Being justified freely. And this translation translates the word a gift. Now, the, the meaning of the Greek phrase is indeed graciously or gratuitously. And the meaning, therefore, is it is unearned and given freely as a gift would be given freely. I'm one of these uh, nutty guys that has a pretty nutty family, several of them here today. But I was raised and my dad was not exactly a communicator. My father went through World War II and as a lot of men who came home from World War II, he did not easily express his love to his kids. I simply don't remember too many times that my dad ever said to me, I love you, son. I just, that was just not part of his personality. My father-in-law, very similar with his family. Both of them were in the war. And they just didn't express themselves that way. My father talked to me usually in jokes. You know, my father may have been the originator of dad jokes, but the way that my father most expressed his love to his kids was by giving us gifts. That's what he did. When Christmas time came around, everything we could ever have wanted was under the tree. That was what my father did to show his love. And I guess it kind of rubbed off on me. I give gifts. We give gifts here at the church. I give gifts at my home. I give gifts. And I never once have anyone pay for it. It's not earned. It's not expecting anything in return. It is a gift. Given out of love to the one it is being given to. And so Paul is saying, you do not earn your justification. It is given to you as a love gift from the Father. He lavishes us with gifts. Look quickly over a couple of pages to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And listen to the way Paul puts this here in Ephesians. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, in the heavenly places. He's blessed us with every blessing. Just as he chose us in him. Before the foundation of the world. That we would be holy. And blameless. Before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons. Through Jesus Christ to himself. According to the kind intention of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed upon us the beloved he has lavished upon us his love and his grace this is the father who gives this gift to us and it is the greatest gift that you could ever have eternal life. 
Life in glory. Life in heaven. As opposed to an eternity in hell. You cannot pay for it. You cannot earn it. You cannot buy your way to salvation. You cannot earn your salvation. Justification. Salvation is a gift from God. Freely given to unworthy sinners. Unworthy sinners. Like you and me. Back to Romans. But if you would please look over. Just to the page. To Romans 5. And this, again, most famous, wonderful verse, 6, Romans 5, verse 6. For while we were still helpless, sinners, remember? We're sinners. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's the gift. His son. His son. The only way that the wrath of God is ever removed from any man is by the grace of God. Bestowing righteousness upon you. Declaring you to be righteous. It is His grace. It is His love. As we mentioned a few moments ago, today marks the 504th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation, if you know anything about it, in fact, uh, if you look at the front of our bulletin, it even has on the bottom the cries of the Reformation. The Reformation had men who stood and proclaimed certain doctrines and certain truths and the uh, truths uh, were summarized in cries that came forth from the Reformation. The five cries of the Reformation were sola scriptura, scripture alone. We don't go by what men say, we don't go by what popes say or priests say or Muhammad says or anything else. We go by the Bible. The Bible alone. That is what we go by. Sola Scriptura. Then Solo Christo. Christ alone. You don't need to go to a priest or a pastor. You go directly to God, directly to God through Christ. Christ alone is our mediator. Christ alone is our redeemer. And then also there is the cry, sola fide, faith alone. Not works, but faith. And soli deo gloria, to God alone is the glory. But one of the five is what we're looking at here today. Sola gratia, grace alone. We are saved by grace. Saved by faith through grace. Salvation by God's gracious gift. Not by our works, not by our, even our lives. We do strive to be holy, it is what we do. But it is grace alone, by the grace of God. You know, that's why we named the church Grace Baptist Church. It's not arbitrary. There's a lot of Grace Baptist churches, I know. And it's not arbitrary. We believe that salvation is by grace. Never earned by God's grace. Now, if you're in Romans, look at chapter 3 again. We're talking about the grace of God, and now compare it again to what he says in chapter 3 and verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness has been manifested. The law is in opposition to grace. They used to have the law. They would go by the law. Now we have grace. Imagine again the godly Jew who is saved 
And you hear Paul talk about this. You know, you hear even our Lord talk about it. You know, you put the law on men's back, you press them down, you oppose them with the law. But I came that men would have freedom and grace and life in Christ Jesus. And so this is what the Apostle Paul is showing. We have been justified freely as a gift from God by His grace. No more law. No more do we live by the law. We live by the grace of God. By His marvelous and wonderful grace. Look, if you would please, at John chapter 1. I told you we might get to this text. We read this a little while ago. And listen to what Jesus says here, what John says here about Jesus. That he came into the world, he came to his own, and his own who were in the world did not receive him. Verse 11, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's grace. You're not saving yourself. It's not even of your will. You're born of God. God is the one who saves men. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory, as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace. And truth. We have the Savior who is full of grace and truth. Now John testified about him and cried out, saying, This is he, this was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is a higher rank than I, he for he existed before me, for of the fullness, for of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. O oh, sinner, if you are saved today, you have received grace upon grace. Not works upon works, not your works upon your works making you good. You've received grace upon grace. And now look at the comparison. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. You got the law given by Moses, and then you have grace through Christ. It's not that the law was bad. It's not that the law was wrong. The law, the moral law, still points men to their sin and their need of a Savior. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's just that you can't be saved by keeping the law. But you can be saved by grace. Jesus. Grace upon grace is what we receive by our Lord Jesus Christ. What a tremendous and dramatic difference the Jew must have seen in the day of Jesus. We keep the law. We have the law. But now we have Christ. Now the Messiah has come. And we have grace upon grace. How much better. How much more wonderful. The love of God. Giving us the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we say we are saved by grace. Saved by grace. Amazing grace. A sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found was blind, but now I see. It's grace. God's. God's grace. Back to Romans 3 for just a few more moments. We are saved only by the matchless grace of God. What does that mean? word mean. The grace of God. It's one of these words that Christians use a lot. But do you know what it means? 
Grace is the unmerited, unearned favor of God. The unmerited favor of God. You know, it's so amazing that so many people still see the God of the Old Testament, God the Father, as the mean God. That God in the Old Testament, he was mean. But now, the God in the New Testament, he's a good God. He's a fun God. He's a loving God. If you're saved by grace, you're saved by God's grace. His grace. God the Father. He is a loving God. He is the God who sent his only begotten Son to die in your sin. The unmerited favor of God. That's the word grace. You need to know that. Put that in your mind. Make sure you understand that. We've been learning some of these things today. So it is God who is worthy of all our praise. He is worthy of all the glory. Now what about Christ? Where does he come in? Well, that is the third part of this verse. We have the transaction, that is the justification, the declared to be righteous. We have the cause, the grace of God, and then we have the means by which it is all possible. Grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. That's next week. Tune in. We'll start on the third part of this wonderful passage next Lord's Day. But before we go today, I plead with you, please. If you've never known the declaration of God declaring you to be righteous, Please know this verse. Read this verse. Understand this verse. And cry out to God for that grace. And if you have been saved, please know this verse. Understand this verse. And know that you have been saved by the gracious grace of God. Amen? Our Father, we are so unworthy. We cannot even begin to express to you our appreciation and thanks. For our salvation is all from you. You are the God who chose us before the foundation of the world and reached down in mercy and kindness and grace and saved us from our sins. Thank you. Thank you for all that you have done. And thank you for Christ, our dear and wonderful Savior, in whose name we pray.